Welcome to segment two, where we will be covering safe practices for the home. Keep pertinent information concerning the child readily available. One of the biggest obstacles that first responders face when handling pediatric emergencies is that depending on the age of the child, they are either unable to communicate at all or their vocabulary is limited and they have a difficult time verbalizing what's wrong. This creates an especially precarious situation when a pediatric emergency occurs without the primary caregiver present. The last thing that first responders want to happen is to have a child under their care whose parents they are unable to contact and whose medical history is unknown. It is advised that you keep a record of your child's date of birth, medical history, medications and allergies, as well as contact information for the child's pediatrician, family members and trusted neighbors, somewhere visible such as posted on the refrigerator, in a location that is known to whoever is caring for the child in your absence. Have basic first aid supplies readily available for use in an emergency. We are already limited in what we can do in the event of a home emergency by things such as lack of personnel on scene, lack of specialized equipment, and lack of a controlled environment. In the case of a first aid emergency, we are almost rendered helpless without the presence of basic medical supplies. It is highly recommended that a first aid kit be purchased for the home that contains items such as dressings, bandages, medical tape, medical gloves, ice packs, trauma shears, tweezers, an emergency blanket, and disinfectant. We always want to use the most sterile bandaging option possible when caring for someone with an open wound. Without first aid supplies available, many people resort to non-sterile items such as towels, rags, and t-shirts to control bleeding. With open access to the patient's bloodstream, any contaminated items could potentially cause the patient to develop an infection. Store the number to poison control in your phone. The number is 1-800-222-1222. Take a second and do this right now. Poison Control provides free expert advice in the case of a potential poisoning emergency. The call centers are staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Reasons that you should call Poison Control are, you believe that someone has swallowed, inhaled, had skin-to-skin -skin contact or eye contact with a poisonous substance, or they have been stung or bit by something poisonous. The most common types of poisonings are household products, medications, toxic plants, and contaminated foods. Poison control operators will gather basic information pertaining to the patient, such as the age, the weight, medical history, source of potential poisoning, method of exposure, and signs and symptoms that they are displaying. From there, the operator will advise actions to be taken. For minor exposures, they may suggest that you monitor the child at home and call 911 should symptoms worsen. For moderate to severe exposures, they will give you basic instructions on how to care for the child until first responders arrive. For example, for swallowed poisons, they may recommend that you don't induce vomiting and don't let them eat or drink anything. If you have not placed a 911 call already and poison control operators believe that transport to the hospital by ambulance is necessary, they will alert 911 dispatchers to respond to crew to your location. First responders will receive the information that you have provided to Poison Control prior to arriving on scene, which allows for immediate treatment and a quicker transport to the hospital in the case of a serious emergency. Preventing an emergency in the home. Secure cupboards and drawers containing harmful substances or potentially harmful objects such as medications, cleaning products, and cutlery with child-proof devices. Store firearms out of reach of children and secure them with childproof locks. Use the back burners on the stove or turn the handles of pots and pans towards the middle of the stove while cooking to prevent children from pulling a hot object or boiling substance down on top of themselves. Install window guards to prevent windows from opening completely to prevent children from exiting the home unsupervised. Securely install toddler gates at the top and bottom of any stairways to prevent a potential fall injury. Set your water temperature not to exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit. This will still provide plenty warm water for baths, showers, and laundry, but will prevent the water temperature from exceeding the point of potentially burning your child. Bathe infants in no more than one to two inches of water. Infants can drown in the shallowest of depths if their airway becomes submerged and they are not yet strong enough to roll themselves over. Avoid overhanging placemats and tablecloths. Heavy or sharp items on the placemats or tablecloths can easily come toppling down on top of a small child. 
Install shock tops over all outlets to avoid your child sticking their fingers, their tongue, or objects into the outlet causing an electrical shock injury. Size toys with the inside diameter of a toilet paper roll. If the toy fits inside, it is assumed that they can potentially choke on it. Install fencing at least five feet in height around swimming pools to include self-closing and latching gates. Drowning is the most common cause of death in children one to four years old. Basic home fire safety, smoke detectors. It is recommended that smoke detectors are installed inside of each bedroom, outside of each sleeping area, and on every level of the home. On levels without bedrooms, install alarms in the common area or near the stairway. Smoke detectors should always be installed on the ceiling. Hot air rises, therefore when smoke is present in an environment, it will rise to the highest point of the surrounding area and begin to bank down towards the floor from there. Whether your smoke detectors are hardwired or battery operated, they will contain batteries. It is of great importance that you change the batteries regularly to ensure proper operation in the case of a fire emergency. A simple way to remember to change batteries in your smoke detectors is to do so semi-annually at the same time that you adjust your clocks for daylight savings. It is also recommended that you check the status of operation of your smoke detectors monthly. Carbon monoxide detectors. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, and poisonous gas. Even in small dosages, it can cause permanent damage or death. Because it is colorless and odorless, the way to detect its presence in the environment is by having carbon monoxide detectors installed in the home. Homes with gas appliances, attached garages, and gas power generators are at a greater risk of potential carbon monoxide emergency. CO alarms should be mounted on the wall or the ceiling in the same room as fuel burning appliances, as well in rooms where people spend the most time, such as living rooms. Additional alarms can be placed in bedrooms, relatively close to the breathing zone of the occupants. There are dual smoke and carbon monoxide detectors available. Have an emergency escape plan. Have a family meeting to discuss the procedures that will be followed if a fire emergency occurs inside of the home. Know where the exits are in the home and obstacles that could prevent you from reaching the exits. Discuss what you will do if the environment is not suitable for making an exit from the home. It is best practice to have all bedroom doors closed shut while sleeping at night. This can be an especially difficult thing to commit to when you have young children in the home. You naturally want to be able to hear children if they cry or call for help at night. You also want direct access to them if needed. Leaving bedroom doors open while you sleep at night, however, could prove to be detrimental in the case of a fire emergency. Actions to be taken in the event of a fire. Fire needs four elements to exist. Those elements are a heat source, a fuel source, an oxygen source, and a chemical chain reaction. Smoke is a byproduct of a material undergoing combustion. Smoke contains heated gases. Smoke will rise to the highest point of the contained area and continue to bank down towards the floor from that point. Smoke contains toxic gases to include carbon monoxide and cyanide. The most common cause of death and injury in a fire emergency is not due to burns, but rather asphyxiation from inhalation of the toxic gases contained in smoke. In the event of a fire, get as low as possible to the floor. That is where visibility and breathable air will be found if present. If there is a layer of clear visibility below the smoke and the location of the fire is known, it may be safe to attempt to exit the home if there is a direct path to the exit. If it is unclear whether there is a direct path to the exit or there is no layer of clear visibility below the smoke, it is best to shelter in place and wait for help. The first course of action would be to shut the bedroom door and place a towel between the crack of the door and the floor. By shutting the door or keeping the doors closed while you sleep at night, you are depriving the fire of the oxygen available in the room, which will reduce the temperature inside of the room in relation to other parts of the home, reduce the level of toxic gases present in the room, and allow extra time to be rescued. Keeping a flashlight in nightstands or underneath the bed can be beneficial in alerting first responders of your presence in the home in the case of a fire emergency. Firefighters arriving on scene will first look for signs of life and potential rescue opportunities. If light from a flashlight is seen by first responders from inside a room, an immediate rescue attempt will be made, giving the trapped persons the best chance of survival. 
Do not attempt to exit out of a window without shutting the bedroom doors first. The fresh air introduced into the environment can worsen the fire conditions inside of the home. Creating a safe sleep environment for infants. Sudden infant death syndrome, otherwise known as SIDS, is the sudden and unexplained death of a baby younger than one year old. It is the leading cause of death for infants one month to one year old. There isn't one specific factor that can be identified as the cause of SIDS. However, ensuring a safe sleep environment for your infant can greatly reduce the risk of SIDS. Do your best to ensure that infants sleep on their backs for at least the first six months or until they can effectively roll over on their own. Put infants to sleep in their own bed always, whether that be a bassinet or a crib. Adults' beds pose serious suffocation hazards to infants to include sleeping adults themselves in the case that they accidentally roll over and cover the baby's airway. It is recommended that you do not use a crib that is more than 10 years old and with cribs that have been previously used, be sure to check and see if the crib has been recalled for any reason. Use a firm mattress, preferably one of the breathable type, and remove any excess blankets, stuffed animals, toys or pillows from the infant's crib when you put them down to sleep. These items pose a suffocation hazard to the infant. The only thing on the mattress should be a tight fitting sheet. Ensure that the bars on the crib aren't spaced more than a few inches apart and that a gap of no more than a few fingers width exists between the mattress and the crib frame. Other safe practices that have been shown to reduce the risk of SIDS are breastfeeding for at least the first six months, swaddling the baby prior to putting them in their bassinet or crib until they are able to roll over on their own and having the baby latch onto a pacifier to sleep. 